Anna Keller runs into some problems, right? She, she gets this, there's this experience of this, this writing of a story uh, called, the, called the, the Frost King, right? And she says, I, uh, I wrote the story when I was at home the autumn after I had learned to speak. We had stayed up at Fern Quarry, late work, Fern Quarry later than usual. While we were there, Miss Sullivan described to me the beauties of the late foliage, and it seems that her descriptions revived the memory of a story which must have been read to me and which I must have unconsciously retained. I thought then that I was making up a story, as children say, and I eagerly sat down to write it before the ideas should, stop, uh, should slip from me. My thoughts, thoughts flowed easily. I felt a sense of joy in the composition. Words and images came tripping to my finger ends, as, and as I thought out sentence after sentence, I wrote them on my braille slate. Now, if words and images came to me without effort, it's a pretty sure sign that they are not offspring of my own mind, but stray waifs that I regretfully dismiss. At that time, I eagerly absorbed everything I read without a thought of authorship, and even now I cannot be quite sure of the boundary line between my ideas and those I find in books. I suppose that is because so many of my impressions come to me through the medium of others' eyes and ears. Right? So, so she's, you know, she's, she's explaining how she came up with the story, but um, as, as you read, it turns out that the story was a plagiarized story. That sh that she she's actually she 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 wrote a story that she actually was read whatever beforehand, and then that she kind of remembered that story and then sort of recreated that story again. Right. So you know when it was published in this newsletter, or it was kind of this uproar when it was discovered that it was it was based on this other story um, that was published in another book. Right. So. This example of, of plagiarism then is something that surprises Keller, and she's you know she's she's you know she's traumatized by the event, and there's you know there's this sort of suspicion that she had uh, purposely, uh, intentionally plagiarized from this other book, and she, you know she insists that she didn't. She she kept she keeps trying to figure out where she might have gotten the story from, and then she finally you know she 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 comes upon this event where. She was probably read this story when she, they, this, when she was in this uh, cabin in the summer, right? But what's you know what's clear in this account is that she has or she claims that she has difficulty distinguishing between what's her own experience and what she reads, right? So that's the claim she makes down there, right? Even though I cannot quite be quite sure of the boundary line between my ideas and those I find in books, right? And her reasoning is that. Um, I suppose that is because so many of my impressions come to me through the medium of others' eyes and ears, right? Because she can't see or hear, when she sees something, it's actually, you know, so she, you know, she has these examples of when she's traveling in a train with Ann Sullivan, and she sees things out the window, but she's not really seeing things out the window. It's Ann Sullivan that sees something and then describes what is being seen with, with words on Helen Keller's palm. Right, so in that sense, Helen Keller feels like she's seeing them, but she's actually not really seeing them. She's she's reading somebody else's account of what they are seeing. Right, so it's even though she, she kind of feels like it's her own experience, it's actually coming through words, and so there's this sense in which it's hard for her to distinguish then what she really sees and what is somebody else's experience that she's taking over through their words, right? And so she's led to this idea, right, that she can't distinguish between her own experience and what she reads, right? The, the, the implication here, and I guess I'll call this the warrant, is that she's, her experience of the world is different from the experience of those who can see and hear, right? And again, I would say, you know, this is her warrant. It's, it's not clear if this is a justified warrant. I mean, maybe it's true that this is what happened to her, but it's, it's maybe it's true for all of us, right? That, that, you know, this could have happened to any child, right, that invents a story, that it was a story that they had read before, that they think they invented, and then they wrote it as if they felt like it was their own story, right? Even though they're, they're kind of copying from something that they, they were... Um, that, they, that they had read before. So it's not clear that this is something that's specific to Hel Helen Keller, right? That, that it only ha this could only have happened to her because of her uh, situation being deaf and blind. It could be that this is something that could have happened to anybody, right? And that, that her experience is not so different from the experience of others. And 
the reason we can we can surmise that we, we th that this might be true that her experience is not so different than ours is from this other passage where she describes her experience of Niagara Falls and here this is, this is sort of the again kind of the, the uh, evidence of the of, of the of the opposite warrant in a sense right uh, and, and and indicating that she's like everybody else she says, it seems strange to many people that I should be impressed by the wonders and beauties of Niagara. They're always asking, what does this beauty or that music mean to you? You cannot see the waves rolling up the beach or hear their roar. What do they mean to you? And so she, her answer, in the most evident sense, they mean everything. I cannot fathom or define their meaning any more than I can fathom or define love or religion or goodness. So here she's kind of just saying, look, I, I can experience Niagara Falls just like anybody, right? They have this meaning that, you know, anybody, for anybody, there's this, you know, how do you define love or religion and goodness? You know, how do you define that feeling when you, when you go to, to Niagara Falls, right? So here she's really kind of indicating the, the other claim that she's really like everybody else. And let's take a look at her reasoning. This is, this is later on in this, uh, in this letter that she writes about Niagara Falls, uh, about her experience there. She says, the hotel was so near the river that I could feel it rushing past by putting my hand on the window. So here she's experiencing the falls, not by seeing them, but through the vibrations. She feels the vibrations through the window, right? And so in a sense, it's that feeling of vibration is fulfilling the same function as sight would for somebody else when they're viewing the falls. And it's not clear whether there's, you know, a really significant difference between her feeling of the vibrations of the falls and our viewing of the falls, right? So the next morning, the sun rose bright and warm, and we got up quickly, for our hearts were full of pleasant expectation. You can never imagine how I felt when I stood in the presence of my Agra until you have the same mysterious sensations yourself. Right? So she's really saying that these are sensations that she has. And she's actually saying that we can't even imagine what kind of sensations they are because we, if, if we haven't been there to experience it ourselves. So she's really focusing on this fact of sensation, of the feeling that she has at the falls, of the vibrations, essentially, that she feels, without seeing or hearing them. And then based on those feelings, she provides this description, right? She says, I could hardly realize that it was water that I felt rushing and plunging with impetuous fury at my feet. It seemed as if it were some living thing rushing on to some terrible fate. I wish I could describe the car cataract as it is its beauty and awful grandeur, and the fearful and irresistible plunge of its waters over the brow of the precipice, one feels helpless and overwhelmed in the presence of such a vast force. I had the same feeling once before when I first stood by the great oceans and felt its waves beating against the shore. I suppose you feel so too when you gaze up to the stars in the stillness of the night, do you not? So here she says that, you know, this meaning of the sensations is not just in the sensations themselves, but in the sort of chain of inferences that she can draw from the sensations, right? So all the stuff that she says about Niagara Falls, a very, you know, vivid and picturesque description that she has of the falls, and she's indicating that she can provide us with this description because she was actually there and, you know, felt the falls. I guess, you know, she's not saying that she saw them, but she, she could feel them, and that's enough because of all the other knowledge that she has that she's able to link up with that feeling, right? So she has the feeling of the falls, she knows about what the falls are, and she can make all of these connections based on the knowledge that she has, that she, she, that she uses to fill in all of the other information based on, the, on the, the one sensation that she has, right? And so there's, there's this sense in which what she's doing is really the same as what we're doing when we see the falls. By seeing the falls or feeling the falls, it's really the same thing in which you have one sort of, one sensation, and that's enough to provide you with all of this additional information based upon the other conceptions that you have that you link up to that, that one sensation. There's no, there's no difference in between what she's doing and what we're doing. And because, mainly because then, and, and I guess this would be, um, that's what I'm indicating as the warrant here is that the meaning of the sensations depend on the conceptions, right? That, that the meaning of what's going on or her experience of the falls isn't 
determined by her ability to see or hear. It's determined by her ability to link up the sensations that she does have to the conceptions that are connected to those sensations. That she, she has this conception of the falls that, that she can link up to the sensation, and that's then what provides her with the experience of the falls. And that's really what all of us do even if we have other sensations that we can use to make this linking, but it's always going to be a kind of, there's going to be, you know, the, the sort of percentage of sensation and the percentage of inference from the cons sensation is going to be, uh, th there's going to be much more conception than there is sensation, right? That the, the sensation is this sort of very brief moment, but that brief moment is enough to give you all of this other experience because it's, it's, that, it's, the, it's these other conceptions that are really defining for the for the for the experience, right?